Italy, the home of opera and passion, filled with architecture and history. It's a place where people know how to live life to the fullest and look ravishing while doing it. In this program, we're on the search for La Dolce Vita, or as they say here, the sweet life. We'll be looking for automotive perfection in Marinella. The sound of this car is unbelievable. For reassuringly expensive shopping in Milan, for men's fashion in Trevero. How much of this material can you get a year? We can make no more than 50 suits a year. And a beguiling sense of magic on the shores of Lake Como. My journey begins in New Bond Street, central London. Even here, there are echoes of that classic Italian flair. Ermini Gildo Zegna is one of Italy's greatest fashion houses, and they've told me they can fit me in no time with something ottimo. I probably will lose a bit of weight. What am I? You're about 36 and a half. I'm very fond of Italy, sir. So Why not? My wife would be so delighted to see me being fitted in an Italian suit, and I cannot <laughs> tell you. I'm going to turn into an Italian. My suit won't be ready for quite some time, but the best things come to those who wait. And I now have a special invitation to visit Xenia's HQ in northern Italy. In these days of increased security and airport delays, the only way to travel is in one of these, an executive aircraft from a company called NetJet. It's taken me 20 minutes from the Bentley to being airborne. Our flight time to northern Italy, just 90 minutes. The seats are comfortable, but it's a little cramped. Is this supposed to be luxury? What would you say are the fundamental attractions of flying private? You know, when you sit in the aircraft and you fly like this, you might think that what we're selling is luxury, when in reality, what we're selling people is time. As we all know, time is the ultimate luxury. Buying that time is affordable, especially for a company. Robert tells me that for 125,000 euros, I can get a block of 25 hours flying time on a jet just like this one. That's around 800 euros per passenger per hour. Easily comparable to commercial business class. It makes perfect sense to me. Milan, a never-ending parade of fashion victims and tiny helpless dogs. Shopping is a serious occupation here. It's not enough to spend a million euros, you have to look the part as well. Bulgari has borne witness to over 10 decades of changing Milanese fashion, but one thing hasn't changed. Bulgari is best for something a little flamboyant. Maybe a diamond pavé necklace at 32,000 euros? Or perhaps a mother of pearl watch at 21,000? But Bulgari offers more in Milan than just shopping. They've taken luxury one step further. In 2004, they opened their first hotel in Milan's most stylish area. La Brera. It's expensive, lavish, and definitely chic. They've tried to strike a delicate balance between luxury, comfort, and cutting edge style. Personally, I prefer something with a little more padding. Still, you can't say it hasn't got atmosphere. 
I'm told that the hotel is built on the site of an old monastery. There's an exclusive spa and a gold mosaic pool. Not sure what the monks would have made of all of this. La Dolce Vita is incomplete without Italy's proudest automotive creation, Ferrari. This morning, I've taken delivery of a gleaming 612 Scaglietti. That's six liters and 12 cylinders Maranello muscle, sheathed in an elegant aluminium body. The car is named in honor of Sergio Scaglietti, one of the greatest names in Italian coachwork. We're heading north to the mountains, and I have to say that this is the perfect way to travel. The sound of this car is unbelievable. I mean, they don't muck around. I haven't checked out half these gadgets as yet. I don't dare press one. There's something here called Sport. I don't think I'd better press that at the moment. But this is a real treat, I and mean, if you really love cars, this is the ultimate car to drive. Everything is sort of handmade here. Look at that, particularly the hand stitching. Everything is hand stitched. All the leather, the steering wheel itself. I mean, it's it's like a beautiful pair of shoes. The interior of this car, and it smells so good. I mean, the moment you get into this car, you know you're you're actually getting into something which is fast and very very expensive. I think they. I mean, a basic, I think this is a basic trim, this. I think this is probably about 215,000 euros. My search for that perfect Italian suit started in London at Amanegildo Zegna. I'm now on my way to meet Anna Zegna, granddaughter of the company's founder. Anna and her family continue a business that was started over 100 years ago. In their factory at Trevero, they produce over 2,000 kilometers of fabric a year, and they supply every major men's fashion brand in the world. They're going to show me the rarest and finest fabric they've ever produced. Now tell me about this, 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 this rarest cloth in the world, this. Hello, this is called Velus Aureum. The idea that they developed comes actually from the history we have in selecting from the 60s the best and the finest raw material in the world. Now, what, what is this made from? This is uh, super fine wool. From? From either Australia or New Zealand. Are you the only people who have this? Yes. It's, Zenia is the only company in the world that selects the material, yeah. that buys all of it, brings it to Italy, and the uh, usually finesse of this wool is uh, around 11, 13 micron. Yeah. Consider that cashmere today is around 16. It's amazing. Zenia was founded in 1910. From its northern Italian headquarters, the company has grown into a worldwide clothing empire. To this day, it's still a family business, but one with 5,000 staff worldwide. It's a typical Italian family business where everything comes from someone who really is a leader, a visionaire, I would say, and who really set uh, the tone and uh, the strategy for the generation to come. Anna puts Zenia's success down to raw materials, the best quality wool washed with soft North Italian water. We are in an area of Italy where the water is very special, it's very soft, and uh, there are rivers that run from this mountain. It was uh, a natural way to develop a textile business. And this is why we are in Trivero and not uh, somewhere else further down in the plain. Even the factory is described in irresistibly Italian terms. You will see looms, 
this is the noise is part of the, fa the factory, but is the one I love. For me, it's not a noise. It's almost a dance. When you see really these fantastic machines that little by little create the fabric and the, the, the movement, it's almost like a symphony. A few hundred yards from the factory, this is where it all started. Tell me, so this was your grandfather's house? Yes, there he is, by the way. Ah. Originally, you said he used to live in the factory. Yeah, actually, he lived uh, just next door. And uh, when he had the house built, he wanted to be able to see from his house the factory. And oh, it's good. very Italian. There are very few uh, reality like this, where you have the house built into the factory surrounding. And that's Xenia, a textile empire still carefully watched over by its founding family. After the break, we'll be visiting the Ferrari factory in Maranello. I want you to tell me what you would suggest of your Formula One cars here that you would suggest would be a good buy for me. And money is no object. Ferrari, a name to conjure with. More than a brand, it's a passion, a part of the Italian soul. For Ferrari fans, this is the Holy of Holies, the factory at Maranello, started by Enzo Ferrari in 1943. Be invited inside is a rare privilege. Ferrari only build about five and a half thousand cars a year, each of which is essentially hand-built and individually tailored. Around the production line, the overall feel is one of quiet devotion. Dedicated craftsmen and women slowly building up the unique specifications of each car. There is automation, particularly in the engine plant, but even here, the emphasis is on hand-finished engineering. The results are impressive. This is the latest incarnation of Ferrari's iconic V12 engine. Today, that engine powers the 599 GTB, the highest performance 12-cylinder car Ferrari has ever produced. If there's one dominant gene in Ferrari's DNA, it's racing. Born in 1898, Enzo Ferrari lived for speed. In the late 20s, he formed Scuderia Ferrari, a race team using Alfa Romeos. The first Ferrari car appeared in 1947. Today, Ferrari's motorsport successes are celebrated all over the world. 14 Formula One World Championships, and the company's legend keeps on growing. Ferrari's Formula One test track is also in Maranello, beside the factory. There's a special department here called F1 Cliente, for well-heeled fans that want to own an F1 car. F1 Cliente restores, maintains and sells F1 cars from 1970 onwards. It's a highly specialized service and it comes at a price. Alberto, this is... Um Every young boy's dream is to be a Formula One driver. And this is one way you can actually fulfill that dream, is it not? Now, You're right. I am a, a, a potential customer, and I want you to tell me what you would suggest of your Formula One cars here 
that you would suggest would be a good buy for me. And money is no object. That's good to start. Well, that's always a good thing. I would yeah. suggest, for example, an F2003 GA car, mm -hmm. driven by Michael Schumacher. The car that Michael Schumacher won, the Monza, the one he retired in, the one, the, the last race. Now, I wanted to buy that. What would I have to pay? Uh, we still don't know, but we know that we already got an option from one of our owners. I say I've got 10 million euros to spend. Would I get the car for that? You can get different cars. No, would I get that car? <laughs> we, at this price, yeah. <laughs> we have not a lot of uh, possibilities. Alberto is a little non-committal, but you can see why. This is quite a selection of second-hand cars, with former owners ranging from Nicky Lauda to Michael Schumacher. And once you've bought your car, F1 Cliente will provide a full race team of engineers to go with it, and they'll transport them to any circuit you care to choose, along with all the spare parts and replacement engines that you might need. As you might expect, Ferrari also catered to collectors of their classic sports cars. I'm here to meet Roberto Valietti, who runs the Ferrari Classica department. The factory has preserved the original blueprints for every part and every car that they've ever produced. So if you're looking to restore your passion to its former glory, this is the place to bring it. Tell me about this car particularly. What has actually happened? What is the history of this car? And what are you actually doing to it? The customer bought the car without the engine and basically called up and said, hey, are you please available for uh, an, an engine? And we said, yes, of course. And basically, we are now ready. The engine is installed, and the engine has been completely So you rebuilt this engine? Absolutely. The car came with the carburetors, the two uh, distributors, some other uh, accessoires, but all the rest of the engine has been redone by us, and now it's completed. It is fantastic. I is this a very rare Ferrari? Uh, rare, yes, in some in some ways, and the car now is come, becoming very very popular, and everybody's uh, trying to buy a 275 yeah. GTB2 and or GTB4. When the work is completed, Ferrari Classica issues a certificate of authenticity, and your car is as good as new once more. My final destination is without a doubt one of the most romantic settings in Italy, Lake Como in the foothills of the Alps. To find out about the area, who better to ask than someone who was born and raised on the shores of the lake? Rita, you call Lake Como your lake. Yes. Tell me why. Is it about the magic? Is it about the essence? Is it about the spirit or the beauty of it? Tell me. It, it's just because I've, I've always been living here. I was born here and I feel it mine. And I like to share it with other people. And I like to speak about my lake with all the people I meet. But what makes it very special for you? For me, the special is, uh, I have to say again, I look around you, it's romantic. It's beautiful, it's uh, peaceful, and every single corner is different. It's colorful, every single season has got its color. And what I love is to look at the lake through your eyes, the eyes of the people who come here. Since the 18th century, Lago de Como has drawn a stream of illustrious visitors, from Barham to Longfellow, from Stendhal to Flaubert and Liszt. The poet Shelley, was moved to write that this lake exceeds anything I have ever beheld in beauty. The lake shore is littered with an extraordinary architectural jumble of fantastical villas, 
elegant retreats for the rich and famous. Property ownership here is strictly limited. Rita tells me that properties rarely, if ever, come on the market. To buy a villa is really difficult. You cannot build any more here on the lake. So what we have is what you see, and as soon as one villa is on sales, I think it takes a minute to sell it. And they don't come cheap. Apparently, a villa was recently sold here for a hundred million euros. But how do you put a price on exclusivity, and more importantly, privacy? Como is famed for its discretion. It's one of the few places in Europe that the paparazzi cannot infiltrate. Why else would celebrities like George Clooney call this magical place home? As you might expect, renting is also an expensive proposition. At this villa, discretion is once again a priority. In fact, the owner politely declines to be filmed. The views are breathtaking. It's an 18th century jewel with a faded North Italian elegance. If you decide to rent this villa, there's room for 26 guests and the property is spread out over seven acres of prime lakefront. The agents, unusual villas, tell me that it's around 50,000 euros for a week's stay. I'm spending my last night in Italy at Como's legendary Villa d'Este. If it's good enough for Greta Garbo, Alfred Hitchcock and Elizabeth Taylor, it's good enough for me. 130 years of spectacular history and some of those characters gazing down from the walls. I've been very lucky. They've given me the largest suite in the hotel, named after Alfred Hitchcock. It goes on forever. Reception rooms, bathrooms, bedrooms. But why sleep when you can gaze out over this? Villa Dese, as an hotel itself, was opened in 1873, so it's, uh, it's our 134 season this year. But uh, the villa in itself uh, is dating back more than 500 years ago. Even today, we continue the tradition to be a place for, you know, it's not a place to be, to be seen, it's more a place to see. It's really, uh, it's really a state of mind. It's for people who really love this timeless elegance. And that's what, that's what I think makes Villa Desse so special. It's hard to argue with that. This place is special. The grounds particularly are breathtaking. And of course, it used to be a private residence, the much-loved home of a Russian empress. And now, as a final treat, I have an appointment with Villa Deste's resident celebrity, the King of Risotto. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. And what better Piacere. place to be in the kitchens of the Villa Deste with probably the greatest chef of all time, Luciano yeah. Parolari, who is known as the King of Risotto. And he is going to teach me today to make his great speciality, which is... Yes, today is risotto with perch. With the perch from perch the lake? From the lake, yes. Fantastic, okay. So, we start with onions. So, we put the onions. This is carnaroli rice. 
Villa d'Este sparkling wine. It was made specially in the Yes. Oh. Bouillon stock. Little flour. How am I doing, Luciano? Oh, good. A little olive oil. Butter. Sage. Two, three minutes each side. A little lemon. You always taste a little bit of your... We taste. Now we finish, eh? Some parmesan. Ah, the spumante. That's okay? On so we, we prepare now. Risotto con persico. Fantastic. Look at that. Alla and I, made it, and I made it all myself. Bravo, Mark. Well, Luciano, grazie mille. Grazie. This is a very typical plate from Como, eh? And there it is, the end of my grand tour of Italy and La Dolce Vita.